Okay. So please close your eyes. And bring the awareness, first of all, to your body, to be kind to your body. Your body has been meditating all weekend. They may have a few aches and pains somewhere. Please be thankful and have gratitude to your body. and try and put it in a position as comfortable as you possibly can get. And I always noticed in my own mind to develop loving kindness, it was like lighting a fire. And if I just put a match on a piece of damp wood, it would never take the flame. So to start a fire, to cook your dinner or to warm yourself in the cold, you'd first of all get, say, a piece of paper, something which would easily take the flame. And once a little paper was burning, then you could put on dry pieces of wood called kindling. I pronounce it different, kindling. And once those little pieces of wood are put on and the fire is strong enough, then you can put on bigger pieces of wood. Sometimes you have to go and put some more kindling on but soon that's the way that you start a fire. And I've noticed when the fire is very, very strong and very hot, you can even put on wet logs, big wet logs, and they too dry out in that fire and start taking the flame too. In this simile, we start loving-kindness meditation on an easy object. And as the fire builds, little by little, eventually you can put on these huge wet objects. Like in loving-kindness, once the loving-kindness is very strong, you can give it to all sorts of people. It surprises you. You can give such kindness to people who you thought it was impossible to be kind to. But you have to put them on at the end. So the little pieces of newspaper to get it going, I usually choose an imaginary object. And to me, I choose a little kitten. If you prepare prefer puppies, a little rabbit, or a little baby, a bird, or any being who you find it easy to give loving kindness towards. One disciple in Sydney, she didn't like kids, she didn't like pets, but what she did have was a pot plant by the window in her apartment in Sydney. She cared for that pot plant. So she used that pot plant as the object of her loving kindness at the beginning. So when I say little kitten, please you imagine something similar which you find it very easy to have loving kindness towards. I usually make it even easier by imagining my little kitten as being abandoned. It's like I imagine going for a walk in the streets around Sheffield. A 
And as I'm walking, I hear this sound. The sound I recognize, it carries a lot of suffering with it, a lot of pain. And I just cannot resist just going closer to that cry for help. And as I go closer, I see in a dark corner and a recess in some old building. And this is where I hear the cries coming from. And I see these two feline eyes staring at me. And I go closer and I can see it's a little kitten being abandoned. For some reason has got no mother to feed it, to care for it. But it's so afraid. I do not need to speculate because I know these little beings, if they've got no one to look after and care and feed it, every time they come out trusting somebody, they get hurt, scratched, bitten, and their fear and pain gets amplified every time. I can just see in those eyes that little kitten has hoped to find a friend, a protector. And every time it's hoped and trusted, it's been bitten, the pain is more, and the hunger and the thirst is never satisfied. That's how I, what I speculate. And now I look in that, those eyes of that little being and I spread that loving kindness to that little animal. Dear little being, whoever you are, I will care for you. This world can be a very hard place. But there are some beautiful beings in this world. Beings who will care for you, guard you, feed you, comfort you, and make sure that you can grow up like every other little being in this planet, without fear, without hurt. And now I cannot help every being like you, but you, I choose. And those thoughts of loving kindness do have an effect, do have power. And I see these two eyes come a little bit closer to me, allowing me to see the fur of a young cat, a kitten. He trusts me enough just to come out a little bit more. Dear little kitten, you can come out all the way. This is not a trap. I'm not deceiving you. Give me the privilege to care for you, to heal your wounds, to wash you, to see you this grow into and trust me and the monks and nuns, to trust us so you play around and create all sorts of mischief, which is not what little kittens are supposed to do. You're my friend. Every time I reassure this little kitten with my thoughts yes. of trust, yes. of care, of love, the little kitten comes a little bit more out of its corner. It feels a bit safer. And as it comes closer to me, I can see why it's so scared. Usually cats, even kittens, have this beautiful, clean fur. This little kitten's fur is all matted and dirty. When I look even closer, 
You can see that that's because there's many scabs of blood. That poor little being, and even its few first days of life, has been bitten, scratched. I wonder why it trusts me at all. I give it this loving kindness. Just bathe it in loving kindness. And this little kitten comes out even further. It does have a remnant of hope. And I realize I have to treat that hope so carefully. So I reach out my hand so slowly. You can see it looking at that hand. What's he doing with this hand? I reach it out so softly and slowly so I can put it under its belly. It lets me. Dear little kitten, I will never harm you. I just protect you. Give me that opportunity. There are some people you can trust. And I pick it up softly, so gently. This little kitten is so light. I can feel its bones through its matted fur. I don't know when it's last eaten. I pick it up slowly and gently. And I wonder at the power of loving kindness. This imaginary little kitten allows me to bring, to bring her right close to my chest. And as it comes close to my chest, I can warm it with my warmth. It's not just physical warmth though. I bring it to my chest because when I share loving kindness, it always starts to tingle in that area. It just, I somehow manage to feel that loving kindness coming from my heart region. And I can feel, even now, the skin above my heart region start to tingle. That's the best description I have. The more I give this loving kindness, the more strong that feeling is in my skin above my chest. And that's exactly where I put this imaginary kitten. Dear little kitten, you may be hungry, you may be thirsty, you may need many of those wounds washed and healed. But right now, I'm bathing you with loving kindness. From the tip of your tail, to each little paw on your four feet, right throughout your body, to your head, to the tip of each one of your ears. You can see the bite marks on them. Poor little kitten. And right to your face around your eyes, which the kitten closes them now. And to the end of every whisker, Dear little kitten, I think you understand. Someone cares for you. You can relax. Just soak up this beautiful food, spiritual food of loving kindness, of mega meta. And as I do that, I keep on not just saying these words, but thinking them and conveying them into this little being I've just found. I will care for you. I will heal you, protect you. You have a friend, little kitten. You have a companion, someone who cares, who will make and doesn't ask anything back in return. And this little kitten I can see not just its eyes closed, I can start to hear little purring begin. Even though it must be 
in pain with hunger and thirst. Yeah, we'll do that soon, little kitten. But the mind, the heart, is even more important to feed, first of all. This little kitten understands it's got a protector at last. Its future is going to be fine. And I zap it with as much loving kindness as I possibly can. And my, my meter, my test, is just how I feel in the skin above my heart. When that's really tingling, I know I've lit in the fire with the easiest thing to light it with, a little paper which takes my, the flame so easily. And I imagine just putting that little kitten down in front of some milk and some food, stroking it, reassuring it. I will be away for a little while, but I will always come back for you, to care for you and protect you. I've got it started. Now I imagine another being a being who's very close to me in this life, a good friend. And even though they may be a human being, or they could be another animal, even that pot plant, something which is alive, which also needs your care. Never ever think and assume that all these beings are successful in life, they're strong, they're fit, they're healthy. Never ever think that they are invulnerable. They also require your kindness, your love, your support, your friendship. So without opening your eyes, you just imagine them as if they're right in front of you in this moment. And you can see what that friend has in common with that little abandoned kitten. They may not be abandoned right now, but they're abandoned with, you know, from fairness, from good fortune, they're afraid of the future. They may be even suffering a lot now. Whatever it is, they are also prone to suffering. So you look at them, this, imagine this being who's your best friend, close companion. Imagine them right in front of you. Say, my dear friend, my companion, I really am here for you. Yes, I do get busy, but I'll find time do whatever I can to care for you, to heal your physical pain and diseases, things which you know, cause you sleepless nights and a lack of freedom to come and go in this world where you wish. My dear friend, if there's any support you need, whatever I can do or give for you, I will do that. I care for you. And you imagine this dear friend and you start pouring this golden energy. I call it golden because that's how it appears to me, coming from my heart through that skin and bathing that friend from their toes to the tips of their fingers, to their ears, their hair, all over and inside. My dear friend, I give you my loving kindness. And you find the more loving kindness you give them, the stronger that golden energy becomes in your heart. That's what feeds the loving kindness by giving it, it gets stronger 
the more you share. And I just bathe that best friend up and down, all over, in and out. Bathe them with this beautiful loving kindness. They need it. And I know that they give it back to me as well. We share our support. We should share our good wishes to one another. We care. And you bathe each other again and again. The fire becomes even stronger, the energy, the light of loving kindness. And then, without opening your eyes, you imagine all the people in this room, everyone in this room, and even if there's one of the people at the doors, just on duty there, guarding, all people in this Quaker's house, people you've been sharing the time with here, helping, serving, eating together, having tea together, walking in the meditation rooms together, sitting together, all your friends on the path, including the two Sangha in front of you. We all share so much in common. We all show our share our vulnerabilities. The fact that we do feel pain, tiredness, rejection, problems, things we relied upon disappearing, taken away from us. But on this retreat, we've become Kalyanamitta's friends, your fellow travelers on this journey. Without opening your eyes, send your loving kindness your golden energy from your heart into the person sitting next to you, on the left, on the right, behind you, in front of you. And allow that, allow that loving kindness to expand, a golden light, a glow, going to every person in this room. And as your loving kindness goes to them, their loving kindness comes to you. Just warming you from the tips of your toes. Spreading right up your feet, right up your legs. If you've been sitting a lot and your knees hurt, right through your knees, right through your butt, sitting on this hard seat, and up through your intestines, healing, soothing. You're not doing it. All the people in this room are doing it for you. With a beautiful loving kindness. Going up further, those of you who have problems with your stomach, your kidneys, your whatever, those of you who have had cancers in your breasts, going further up to your shoulders, those who have had any injuries, any operations, we all heal one another with our good will. Please be receptive of that. It does actually work. Kindness is incredibly strong if you let it come in. It's like a golden energy filling this room and goes down your arms, past your <laughs> elbows and wrists to your fingers, going up to your neck up to your brain, 
in your brain with the home of many negative emotions, grief, sadness, anger, disappointment. Let that loving kindness heal all of that. May I be happy and well. May I be free from fear. Just by knowing that people care for you, they really do, even though they not, may not be known to you. They not be, may not be relations. They may be <coughs> not the same country as you, but they're human beings. We care for one another. And when we've been meditating for three days, the power behind that loving kindness becomes incredibly strong. May all beings in this room be at peace. May all beings in this room share that peace they've grown together. May all people, including those listening online, may you also be like you're in this room, sharing, receiving, giving this beautiful, beautiful loving kindness until in this room the loving kindness becomes too strong to be contained within these walls and the roof and the windows it kind of bursts out without breaking any glass or any bricks it just seeps out and goes to all of the the buildings and people surrounding us, all the people walking along the streets in the cold, all the people in the offices or schools or educational establishments around us, all the homeless people too. May all beings in this vicinity, in this part of Sheffield, be warmed and healed. You may be so similar to that abandoned kitten. You may feel that you've been abandoned by your boss, by good fortune, by health, by your family. But you have us. We are sending this powerful golden light of loving kindness everywhere without any discrimination right to the whole of Sheffield. May all beings in this city, not just human beings, cats and dogs and birds and squirrels, everything above ground, in the air, underneath the ground, may all beings in this great city be well and happy. May you know the secret of peace. May you be healthy. Even if you are sick, may our energy heal that sickness, or at least take away the pain. May all beings in the prisons in Sheffield feel that they are free in this moment when they know that people are thinking about them. The world is not such a bad place, you don't need to perform any crimes anymore. May all beings in this city be at peace, be healthy, feel free, feel hopeful. We spread this loving kindness even further the city of Sheffield, no matter how big it is, can't contain this. So this loving kindness spreads further south through Chesterfield, <laughs> further north to Hull, throughout the whole of England. Not just England, down to, up to Scotland, to Wales, down to Cornwall, which always thinks it's a different country than England. <laughs> I don't care. 
down across the channel to the to Europe, which really is always part of us. Like all beings in Europe, all beings in Scotland and Iceland and Greenland, the whole lot. We spread this loving kindness to all of you, to Norway and Sweden. If you think it's cold here, oof. people in Norway, they need a lot of warm, loving kindness. All beings. Further, as we spread this loving kindness to Russia and Ukraine, further, so all the other parts of Asia and to Africa. Sometimes the conflicts in Africa get forgotten. There are beings there too. May all the beings in Africa know that harmony, non-violence, forgiveness is the path to good fortune for everyone, all the animals, in the sky and under the earth, over to the Americas, north and south, over to Europe. So Europe, are we done in Europe? If I do it again, I don't care. <laughs> I actually do care, that's why I do it twice. Over to Asia, you know, in Asia, again Ukraine over to the Middle East and think, all these people, whether they're Jewish or Palestinian, they look the same to me. So I give loving kindness to all of them, to all those people afraid and don't know how they're going to live. To all those people in the eastern part of Asia, and to India, where the air pollution is so bad. Huge number of people. May all the people in India and China, and Japan and Korea. I know many of these people. Some of these are my really good friends. Animals, birds, beings under the ground. Over to Australia and New Zealand. So many people I care about, and even people I don't care about, today I do. This loving kindness, like a golden blanket of love, covers this whole planet, not missing out a tiny square inch. And it's not even just for the, the humans and the animals and the birds, it's also for the planet itself all the little seeds in the ground. May you germinate. May the grass be green. May the fires which destroy go out. May the biology in the oceans thrive again. So every animal in the oceans has something to eat, to be healthy, to be free. May the whole world receive the loving kindness of this small group in Sheffield. We put this loving kindness all over the planet with warmth. You may have noticed when you share this loving kindness, some of it goes to people you say, why am I giving loving kindness to these people who create wars? They need it more than anybody. And now you realize there's also one other person you've missed out. It's called you. Imagine you're standing in front of a full length mirror, and there, this person who bears your name. Spread that, some of that loving kindness to yourself, up and down, 
<coughs> not missing a part of your body or mind. May I be happy and well. May I be free of pain and worry. May I know this peace of not having to be different than I am. Realize people like me as I am. May you like yourself as you are, giving you this unconditional loving kindness with no, no fault finding, only respect finding, whoever you are. Now imagine that golden energy, the blanket, drawing it back in, but leaving the warmth out there. You draw the energy back in, but the warmth stays in the furthest parts of the globe. As it comes in, you draw it in, draw it in to Europe, draw it in to UK, draw it in like it's zooming back in to Yorkshire, zooming it in to Sheffield, collecting it in to this Quaker's house, drawing it into this room, drawing it into your own heart. And it becomes this intense ball of golden loving kindness, like a nimitta. And it's hovering in your heart. And imagine your heart like a pure white lotus, fully open. And it hovers on top of that, still leaving all the warmth of love outside. The golden light stays inside of you. And that white lotus, the petals slowly closing to embrace that loving kindness, to protect it, to be used as a seed the next time, the next place. That ends the loving kindness meditation. And now invite Ayachanda to give the final blessing. Sorry? Let's both do it. It's nice. <coughs> both do it, okay. Both of us. Okay, whatever, I'll follow you. You start it. Do you know that chant? Whatever, yeah. I'll hum the tune. <laughs> Sape sata Sape para Sape buta Sape purgala Sabe ata bawa pariapana Sabae tio Sabe povisa Sabe aria Sabe anaria Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Winiparika Awira Hon Tu Abya Paja Hon Tu Ani gahon tu Suki atanam pari harantu Dukha munjantu Yada lada sampatito 
So, so for going on a bit longer. But do you really want to have the photo taken? Well, should we have a chat first? Have a chat first, yeah. yeah. As you all know... Can I first say one thing? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you, Ajahn, for being here, first of all, and for sharing your incredibly profound and humorous and accessible <laughs> and compassionate wisdom with all of us, even if it's not yours. Yeah. I'm thinking this five khandas sitting right here yeah. who's come all the way from Perth with a great lot of effort to yeah. support not only me by any means, but the spirit of the Dhamma in this country. Yeah. And all of you individually as well, even though Ajahn said, you know, he won't know most of you perhaps, but it doesn't matter because beings everywhere suffer and yes. wherever... We both go. Beings wish to find a path to peace. And uh, I just want to thank not only Ajahn, but also all the volunteers. So Shell and Linda and Casey and Minori and Darren and Matthias, who's making these teachings spread far and wide. <laughs> and of course, everyone here with us for your practice and for your kindness in receiving the teachings. It's such a blessing to... Um, share Dhamma with people who have kindly eyes and who really just want to benefit themselves and thereby all beings that they come in contact with. So thank you because you take the Dhamma outward and onward into the world. And um, also to the people listening live, um, many of you wanted to join and we only had like a fairly middle-sized venue. I'm sure we could have got Maybe not Wembley Stadium, Ajahn, but <laughs> maybe double the space. It's just harder and harder these days to find a place, and so it's wonderful that we have the online um, facility as well, thanks to Matthias and all the other volunteers who've made it happen. Paul, our Facebook coordinator, thank you, Paul. And, uh, yeah, you can also find these teachings again, listen again on our YouTube channel, Anu Kampa Bikuni Project, as all of you know. The Facebook page is the same name, and uh, hopefully you know of our website as well by now, so other events coming up. Um, I'm teaching a three-day retreat here for, I think, 28, 29, 30. It's a New Year retreat, but it gives you a chance to go home and be with your family on New Year, if you wish. <laughs> <laughs> or run away. <laughs> or just say, you know, <laughs> you can't really lie, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, you can say you've been on a retreat and you just need to keep continuing if you don't want to go home doesn't matter so we can be your family at that time and it's online too I'm told so that's organized by Sheffield Insight who've been using this venue for a long time sadly it won't be available any longer though because the Quakers are kind of going a bit bust and they need to start uh, using it on a long-term basis to different groups, so we won't be able to rent it out. But they've been very kind to us, and thank you to the volunteers, I think. Are you one of the volunteers? Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and uh, facilitating our retreat, and just quietly and compassionately doing all kinds of unseen things in the background. Thank you so much. And uh, it really is a lovely space because of the practice that you had here for, and will continue to have here for hopefully many, many years. So, um, yeah, I, uh, as usual, wanted to talk a bit about the project, but kind of let Ajahn Brahm do that a bit and maybe ask people how you'd like to be involved. So, um, yeah, would you like to say something about how mm -hmm. this why and how it all began, or something, yeah, it's just, whatever you wish. You see, this, you see the great potential of Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. It does need a monastery, not just for women, but for all beings. And, you know, even that gender diversity, whoever you are, you can imagine what it must be like, you know, to be rejected and think you haven't got a spiritual home. 
And already we've just got one bhikkhuni here. Lots of people would love to become bhikkhunis, support, share. So I just remember in the time of the Buddha you get these really stupid people. They, their relations called them stupid, like an Pindaka. He found some land and he put a gold coin on every part of it, covered it in order to buy it for the sake of the, that was the Jetavana Monastery, Anatta Pindaka's park. So, if you know anybody who's got too many coins, <laughs> or anybody listening, and I say this because I don't get anything out of it whatsoever, but except just the joy of having a place where this bhikkhuni project doesn't just stagnate, but it grows. And it becomes the inspiration for each one of you and for your children, your children's children. People often complain about, well, as I hear anyway, oh, things are going down in UK. Make them go up. <laughs> See who you can talk to and raise a dollar here or a pound there and see if we can just go to the next stage of Anukampa and actually get a forest monastery. Why not? Yeah. Can you imagine it? Imagine this lovely forest. And some mountainside somewhere. <coughs> not too far from support. Yeah, well, we'd we'll have <laughs> helicopters, I don't care. <laughs> can you imagine it? in a place where you can go for a retreat so you don't have to worry about coming here. Yeah, your own little retreat center, go for broke. In a place where any one of you, you can invite your friends to your ordination. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine just the joy. <laughs> Look, I shouldn't say this, but I probably have to anyway. If any of you ordain, I'll just get on a plane from Perth and just come and do the chanting for you. That's what I can do. You said it. Yeah, but <laughs> stupid Ajahn Brahm. No, he will. Because that's how much I care for this. Yeah. Give so much. That's, that's what I can do. I can't give any money because as a monk you don't have money. But I can give something even bigger, give my heart. And actually that's the best thing everyone can do. Because sometimes, you know, many, many people write to me even from Perth. They say, oh, when I've got more money, I'd love to support a bikini monastery. But actually you're doing it already just by, you know, supporting it in spirit and, and through deed. But also, you know, we have how many thousand people on social media and on our YouTube channel? How many? Like maybe 15,000. I mean, if everybody just gave a cup of tea's worth every month, imagine, we'd be there, you know, in no time. So it really isn't about that. It's just about putting energy where you want the Dhamma to flourish. You know, what is it in this life that you really invest in? What are you invested in? Are you invested in busyness and stress? Are you invested in peace? Because that's all we're doing really. We're sharing our energies, right? We're sharing our kindness, our generosity, our intentions. The Buddha always said everything starts in the mind. So, yeah, hopefully we'll have somewhere soon that we can all come and keep developing peaceful states. It's not just for this generation. Hundreds of years, <laughs> thousands of years. And you know you were here at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, it is historic. It is. Yeah. So you just go past all these buildings in Sheffield, really old ones. and. I don't know who was responsible for those, but it's lasted such a long time. How about a nice building or somewhere in UK? So women, bikunis, can feel that they're part of society. Yeah. So anyway. So I'd like to ask if anyone has questions, because there are obviously practical things involved, yeah. not just dreams and visions, but practical questions as well, so I don't know if anyone has any ideas or any questions or things they'd like to share, that would be really welcome. You can also say, why do we need monastics, you know, we don't mind. 
because yes. women want to be monastics. Great, that's what I was thinking actually. <laughs> Sorry, what do you think? Like clockwork, specific area. Yeah. Do we have a specific area? Ideally, at this stage in the project, it'd be really great to be close to Oxford because that's where the Vihara is now. And one of the things we haven't talked much about is the fact that bhikkhunis are arms mendicants, just like monks. So we can't cook, we can't use money, we can't drive. Um, especially the driving and the using money is uh, basically means we're dependent on people who come and serve feed us, take us about, and uh, can actually access the place. So most of our supporters at the moment, I guess, are sort of around Oxford. We have some in Stroud as well, both cities. Stroud's kind of a, a town type city. I don't know if it's a city. Um, it's kind of semi-rural, but both of them have train lines direct to London, which makes it accessible and possible. Um, but on the outskirts of Oxford, if we want to be within easy reach of the city, say three, four, five miles away, it is expensive. And unfortunately, the same goes for Stroud. But at this point, we kind of have to go where the people are. And that limits us a bit. Even uh, my first teacher, Goenka, when he was, um, he, he's founded Vipassana centers all over the world. And he always said that a place should be tranquil, yet easy to come to where people can reach. So this is the kind of balance we're trying to strike. And it is difficult in England because things are so built up even several hundred kilometers probably or miles from London, it's still fairly built up. Whereas in Perth, you can have a forest monastery 40 minutes from the city and you're in the bush. You know, you can get 600 acres for the nuns monastery. That's what it is. Um, and uh, here that's really hard. So I think yeah. I'll ask them to send 100 acres over. Yeah, that's fresh. a good idea, Jen, of bush. <laughs> yeah, with kangaroos. <laughs> so yeah, they're the kind of rough areas, but it really depends on um, on our resources, which is why we want to try for the best, because once we do land in a place, that will probably be our place for quite a few years. I'm getting old, as you can see. So I don't know if I can do this twice in my lifetime. So I want to kind of go for the place that gives us most possible chance to, to flourish. Um, so for that reason, we want to do our very best. Yeah, yeah. But again, if people have other ideas, um, places I don't even know. I have not lived most of my adult life in England. In fact, the vast majority of it I've lived in Asia. Only a few years back here since Ajahn sent me. So, so I don't know this country too well. Yeah. <coughs> Anyone want to say something? Yes. Go on. Yes. How do you go on alms around in Oxford? Do you like go down right. Somewhere? Well, this is an interesting one. It's an important part of uh, our practice is to actually go out with the ball. But we haven't been able to do it yet, partly because of the weather, but mainly because of my <laughs> admin load, to be frank. So like, to me at the moment, it would look like a real privilege to go begging in the street because I actually don't have much time. So, so far, the way that we're fed is by having visitors come and stay and then they can um, integrate themselves and like, orient themselves to monastic life a little bit. So they join in like the communal work period, usually only two or three visitors at a time, sometimes only one. And then in the afternoon, there's the solitude. So this is how we balance our day. Um, and they'll cook and also people can come and offer lunch. Um, usually we eat at 11. So ideally, if you want to come, you bring the lunch at that time. But if you want to bring lunch and you can't drive at that time, you can do it by ordering online and sending something from the local sushi shop or whatever. Or you could even come over in the evening and offer a cooked meal and, we, and the lay guest can, uh, can heat it up the next day. So however you want to come and be involved is wonderful. And um, hopefully there'll be another nun with me again next year visiting. So when there's two of us and the weather warms up, I think we'll try the arms round. Yeah go with our bowl into Oxford and see what happens. <laughs> it's amazing. Sometimes people are really kind. Oh, and yeah. I noticed just walking around in Sheffield with Ajahn Brown, we do get some attention more than when there's only one. Because <laughs> when there's one, they just think, what's this? Is this just a weirdo like wearing odd clothes? <laughs> <laughs> right? But when there's two, it's like, this is a thing. <laughs> this must be a thing, you know, like something that other people might do as well, even though 
Yeah, maybe we're just a couple of odd bods, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we do get some, uh, some attention and people that maybe aren't Buddhist and have never meditated say, you know, what's going on? And they see the friendliness, they see the kind of approachability and they get interested. So put a couple of leaflets here and there in Sheffield as well. <laughs> yeah, so I think Arms Around is a really good way of um, attracting the locals. And the Buddha said, you know, it's when the locals and the, uh, a good representation of the general population get involved that you can say Buddhism's arrived. If it's only catering to one particular um, part of society, you know, one gender or one race, it's not really become universal in the way the Dhamma should. So we want to be accessible to all, all ages too. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? Uh, question, because I know you get asked it quite Yes, you just asked one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Considering ordaining, how would you go about it? Okay, so what's the process to ordination? So often people are considering ordination and sometimes it's just an idea. Sometimes it just sounds like, oh, great, I can live a peaceful life as a nun, but we don't have a lot of idea about what it really is. And other times it comes about through practicing, right, for a long time. And in my case, it came through the practice and it came naturally as a wish to renounce more. I'd already renounced a lot and didn't see the need to pick it up again in the world. So I actually felt when I was on my long retreats, like, why would I stop? I'm not actually interested in, in doing anything else except serve the Dhamma and meditate a lot. So for me, it was a natural process in. And I think even if you haven't got much experience, but you've got this curiosity, it's good to start by visiting. Visiting a monastery, first of all, maybe visiting a few. Um, if you're a woman, there aren't a lot of places. If you're gender non-binary, even fewer perhaps, but there will be um, mostly bhikkhuni monasteries probably that will be open, uh, hopefully to all. Um, for men, there's a lot more option. There's many monasteries in this country but if you want to go to a monastery that's more uh, aligned with the early Buddhist texts, I think I dare to say that, um, and less, uh, not necessarily in the Thai or in the Burmese or whatever tradition, but kind of takes the suttas as its lead, then Perth. Sorry, you're full, Ajahn, I know. Uh, <laughs> look around. But yeah, for women wanting to explore this path, come and visit, come and stay for a week and get to know whether you feel at ease, whether you feel that the teachings resonate for you, uh, how the lifestyle supports or doesn't support your practice. Um, keep doing retreats, come to our online stuff. We have um, Wednesday evening every day a chanting and dedication session. We have meta meditation every other Saturday and we have sutta discussions every Friday, which is my favorite thing, and other Dhamma talks. So get to know us and get to know other members of the community and just, yeah, apply then for a longer stay. So roughly speaking, and this can go on f across several years, um, the process would be to stay for a month then to stay for three months. And if you're coming for three months as an aspirant, as someone who's potentially interested to ordain, you'll start to take on a few more duties. We'll start to figure out how you might fit into a role of service towards the Sangha. And then, generally speaking, you would take eight precepts for a year as an Anagarika. And you might have seen people in other monasteries wearing white. They're uh, still lay people, but they're living in monasteries, stewarding the Sangha, taking on a bit more responsibility. And then two years as a novice. That might be adaptable because for, for monks, it's only one year. And I know that in some countries, they're cutting it down for bhikkhunis as well. Uh, because I don't think there's anything that absolutely insists on the two. But generally speaking, so far, it's been two. And then it's a Sangha decision. It's up to the other nuns in the community to decide when and whether to give you the full ordination, if that's your aspiration. So it's a process. It's a vocational training, if you like, only in a spiritual sense. So after five to seven years, you're fully fledged and you'll be pushed out there to start sharing Dhamma, <laughs> if not before. <laughs> so yeah, for bikinis joining me, um, for women joining me, 
you'll probably be in quite a, um, an involved service role. And I hope to see you become Dhamma teachers in due course. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, but it's a personal journey, so it won't be one fit for all. Yeah. I have a question that might sound controversial, but which is not. I'm interested to understand the mechanism of women and men inequality. I guess in lay life, according to what I've listened to, like social social sociologists who study these issues, they say that men need women um, to have children, to have male uh, descendants, and to uh, perpetuate their name. Um, in the religious people, they don't need that, so they don't need uh, this disequality between men and women. Hmm. And um, they don't need money, or um, there's no power involved. So I'm trying to understand where it comes from, this disequality hmm. between men and women. Um, in religious life. So for the yeah. online people, the person's asking about inequality between men, men and women in the religious life, because it's not actually necessary. Like in the in the lay life, it might be kind of almost, I don't know. Well, there are many. There are many. Yeah, this is sociologists this, that have looked at it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to start? Or? Yeah. Well, in Buddhism, there's no reason for it at all. So I'm not sure where it came from, but there is that here right now, even in UK. So the only thing to do, instead of saying why did this happen to us, let's fix it up and give equality. There's no real reason for it. Mm. It's embarrassing. If you're a man or a woman, or gender non-binary, why can't we have uh, equal opportunity for all beings? Nothing else makes sense to me. You know, one of the reasons I think it has got stuck in traditional Buddhism is precisely because of the cultural overlay and you know if if buddhist teachings are say practiced in thailand which is a very patriarchal society and you know not only the men but the women also have internalized that a lot um, then that's going to in, infect the teachings um, and i think another problem is that traditionally the monks have um, been the sangha there haven't been uh, bhikkhunis <coughs> for a long long time and the setup is that they are fed mostly by women. So there's an incentive there for them to not give the ordination, so they continue uh, to be fed. These days that's not really valid. But it is. And these days, <coughs> it's not just fed by women, it's fed by men. Many of our dana in Perth comes from men. But in Thailand, what percentage oh. of people who feed the monks are men? The monasteries I've been to, like Wat Pa Ban Thad and like many yeah. other forest monasteries in Thailand, there's a whole area where women live, usually on eight precepts yeah. and often very skilled meditators. They stay exactly. there just to cook. There are no male areas in that monastery where men stay to cook. The men have yeah. kutis. In the men are usually ordained. In that Thai tradition, where the women would come, when I was a young monk, mm. we were, women would come to feed us. This yeah. is in Thai tradition. The men would come to do the work. Yeah. And it was amazing to see that they take days off, weeks off to clean the place. Right. That was their service. Mm. But nevertheless, that was such a long time ago. Yeah. And now instead of actually trying to <coughs> imprison ourselves with the past, and let's make sure that we have um, equality here. Whoever wants to cook. And how many meals have I got, you know, from a uh, lovely cooks. I had some more of your shepherd's pie today. <laughs> to cook by men. Yeah. I don't care who cooks. It's just an opportunity to give. Don't think it has to be this one gender or another gender. We want to have that equality. And let's make that equality. The biggest thing is actually just let's get a place. The biggest burden, I think, or the biggest obstacle is not people so much as getting the funds together to build a proper forest monastery for women here. There's enough men and women to support that. Right. Let's just make it happen. However, 
<laughs> you said it wasn't controversial, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> However, as bhikkhunis, we don't tend to have the support of traditional Buddhists in the way that monks do because, and I'm not saying nobody supports, but we don't have a huge following of people who come simply to make merit by offering to nuns because it hasn't traditionally been um, even recognized as a, merit, a field of merit. There hasn't been a bhikkhuni sangha. So people are, in, how do you say, inculcated? Yeah, it's a condition to it think that changed. it's meritorious to support monks. And this has real implications for bhikkhuni sanghas all over the West. Not over in the South, though. Yeah, in Australia it's different for one reason, because the main sangha, the monks, have actually said, come and support the bhikkhunis. So because of that, because people respect the monks, they now support the bhikkhunis. And now, because they've given the bhikkhunis a chance, they see that they're worth supporting. But if you don't give us a chance then you won't understand that we're worth supporting. So these attitudes need to change. And unfortunately, in many countries, especially not only Asian countries, but some countries like Thailand, and I don't know other Asian countries too, I'm sure, do think that you have to be a man to get enlightened. And this is a really deep-seated belief. So it's education as well, right? These are kind of really deep-seated uh, ideas that don't change overnight. So that's why what we're doing is quite um, pioneering and maybe controversial. I mean, even in this country, some of the sangha, the monk sangha, say, oh, bhikkhunis are controversial, as if it's not really even, they're not even sure we're valid, that the ordination's valid. So all of these things are part of what I face daily, and I feel the uh, effect of these things daily. And so a big role for me is actually educating people. Yes. Indeed. I have another question. <laughs> well, I, haven't read, I haven't read the Sutta, but as, um, I have read extracts. Yeah. As, um, I think maybe the Dhammapada, where they say, where the Buddha says he has plucked out the, the thorn of lust. Yes. In many religions, the yeah. lust and the sexuality is focused on women who is the sinner or something yeah. like that. Is it in Buddhism like thorn no. of lust? Lust is evenly. We have equity in lust. <laughs> I wanted to make sure because originally there was no discrimination. Yeah. The Buddha ordained bhikkhunis. The Buddha started that. That was his mission in life. This is not just stating this as as a wishful thinking. When he was fully enlightened, we'll look after the time yeah, because it's good though. It's good stuff. Yeah. When, <laughs> when he became fully enlightened, Mara, like this devil tempter, came up and said, well done, okay, I admit it now, you're fully enlightened. Please don't teach, it's a big burden. Just go to Parinibbana, just leave. And the Buddha replied, I will not enter Parinibbana, I will not leave until I've established a strong male Sangha plus a strong female Sangha, plus many lay men, plus many lay women in the Dhamma. And it was only under the Charpala Shrine when Mara came again, people blame Ananda for this, but no, that uh, the Buddha, uh, Mara asked, well, you've, you've got a very strong a bhikkhuni sangha now, a strong bhikkhu sangha, a strong lay people, strong lay women. Remember your promise? Now you can uh, parinibbana. And the Buddha said, okay, in three months I'll keep my promise and I'll enter parinibbana. It wasn't that Ananda forgot to ask him. This was the Buddha's mission and plan from the very start. He will not go until he's done that job of establishing strong sanghas on both sides. Enlightened. Enlightened, yes. That's what means strong sangha. Yeah, could I just make the quick point just to summarize what we said, that there's a difference between Buddhism as a religion and the Buddha's teachings. So if you see these opposite things happening in so-called Buddhism, it's not following the Buddhist doctrine. Correct. It's just cultural and human influence, human delusion affecting the way it's practiced. The Buddha was very clearly equitable. 
And even this fourfold assembly was meant to cover all beings. It's just the way it was expressed in that at that time to exclude nobody. Yeah, even gender non-binary. And transgender. Just a quick one. Sure. Um, in our local small Buddhist center, it's a probably a different path, but it's definitely not a forest uh, tradition. But I see women and men, they are ordained, they wear mm. the thingy around their necks. They have, they accept, you know, the, um, some good names. Is that separate from what you are talking about? Yes. Uh, is that the, um, under the, uh, is that, what's the name? I forget now. It used to be Tree Ratna, maybe? Maybe. Probably. Yes, it's different. It's a lay organization and the um, ordinations aren't kind of according to the Vinaya. So it's, it's um, a kind of, what would you call it? What is, what is the tradition? I think it's the Tree Ratna, I'm pretty sure. I think, I think that one. Yeah. Yeah. Sangha Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, it's different. Right. Yeah. But not according it's to not the traditional. Buddhist Vinaya. It's not day. authentic from the very past. Right. Hi. Yes. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> mid of uh, next year, me and my partner, who should be sitting there. Hi. Okay, hi. <clears throat> Somewhere. <laughs> um, we want to take like half a year off of our work to. Um, be part of a spiritual community and serve in a certain way and we're still looking for options yeah um, and maybe also want to ask like is there a um, maybe a opportunity or something for serving you know your projects like yeah so I mean certainly in theory and you can write to us team at anukampaproject.org but the issue for us is we, the space. I mean, at the moment we have two rooms on the third, uh, second floor, which are for me and another bikuni, and then one guest room. That's all. <laughs> so at the moment that's very difficult, but certainly when we get a bigger space, then that may be possible. So yeah, it'd be great. Maybe the last one, because we want to take a group photo and then tidy up before everyone disappears. Yes. Is there an expired date of being ordained for many? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in the Vinaya, uh, the monk's discipline, the expiry date was 120. <laughs> 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 there was one young man, he ordained as a novice. A few months later, he ordained as a bhikkhu. A few months later, he became enlightened, all in his 120th year of life. It's called leaving it to the last moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's just practical. Can we look after you? Yeah. That's all. Mm. But technically no expiry date. Can we look after you? And how developed is the monastery in terms yeah. of what the resources that are needed? So in my case, I mean, I need help from people that are going to have, you know, quite a lot of energy left. So that's the thing. It, you have to balance the situation. But well, please, let's make it happen. Okay, shall we end? Because I know that many of you may have to get going, but what I'd really like to suggest, if people wish, is uh, a photo together. Would that be a nice thing to do? Yeah. At least with all those who wish. Come, come quickly. <laughs>